Welcome back. Um, so today what I'd like to do is um, finish off with where we left off and talk about this new uh, topic on formulating research questions. Uh, but I just want to remind you, we started talking about research methods um, and how they're all limited in some way and how I promise to try really hard to convince you that they're also all useful uh, by the end of the semester. Um, and how we're uh, going to learn all kinds of strategies to overcome or reduce their uh, inherent limitations uh, as part of this course. Um, there were a couple of slides about this course that I didn't get to go through, so I'm going to go through those quickly. Um, what this class is and isn't about, in case you're still uh, wondering why you're here, maybe your advisor is forced you to or something, otherwise you have no choices. Um, so this class is not a software engineering class, even though I do do research in software engineering. Um, in fact, it's probably more of a science class than a class about any particular CS discipline. Uh, we're really not, or I, I really don't care about the technical details of all of these papers that we'll be discussing, uh, but I do care about their study designs and research methods and all of that. Um, you will, however, see lots of examples from uh, areas of CS where I do research, where, where I'm more familiar with the literature, including papers from software engineering and, and other fields. Uh, but it is by no means a software engineering class. So, uh, you know, you don't need any prerequisites in software engineering to enjoy this class, I hope. Um, okay. Um, the other thing, this, this class is not about communication, but it secretly is about communication um, because um, we will uh, practice a lot of communication. Um, you will um, be asked to articulate what the problem uh, is uh, and why it's important and what uh, this proposed solution in some paper you're reading was, what, what your proposed solution to your research is going to be and so on. Um, you'll be asked to give an oral presentation or two. You'll be asked to present uh, research papers on your own research. You'll be asked to present uh, research papers that others have written. There will be a lot of presentation stuff and writing stuff and communication stuff more broadly. Um, and this is all very useful uh, because, you know, as it turns out, research in uh, whatever area you're in is also ultimately a very human endeavor. Uh, and, you know, uh, you and your advisors and whatnot need to convince funding agencies and, and colleagues and reviewers for the papers you're writing and submitting that all of this work is worth doing and funding and supporting and so on. And all of that requires good science communication, so, which is why this is why we're practicing it here, among other places. Um, okay. Um, it's also not about peer review, but it secretly is about peer review because we'll be critiquing tons of research papers. Um, so, you know, hopefully by seeing many examples of research papers that others have written uh, before us, you get to learn how to write better research papers of your own uh, going forward. Um, so this is kind of secretly a goal of the class uh, as well. Um, finally, maybe the most important thing, the one that I am personally most excited about, at least, um, this class is about instilling in you a uh, hopefully healthy dose of skepticism so that, you know, next time you hear all kinds of claims in science or media or otherwise, you will think critically and twice about them. Um, so. Hopefully you'll learn to be critical uh, evaluators of claims and science in any field and uh, frankly to call out the bullshit whenever you see it uh, better than you were able to before you took this class. That's hopefully uh, the main outcome of this and the one that I'm personally most excited about. Uh, okay, all right. So what I'd like to do today, uh, and we didn't get to do this before, is hear from each of you a little bit about uh, who you are um, and what your research interests are. Uh, and uh, very importantly, what it is you're hoping to get out of this class, uh, because I will do my best to give you that at all possible. 
Um, so, you know, we'll go around, spend a couple of minutes or a minute each uh, kind of introducing ourselves um, so we can, first of all, get to know each other a bit better because we'll be interacting a lot. And second, for me to get a sense of how I can best help you. Um, and second, we'll spend the remainder of class thinking about uh, research questions, formulating research questions. This is arguably one of the you know, earliest, if not the earliest thing you will do as part of a research project. You, you, know, you start from some question and then you figure out how you go about answering it and then you do all of that work to answer it. And then you write it up and then you talk about it and so on and you keep doing this over and over again until your advisor gives you a PhD or you burn out, whichever occurs first. <laughs> Um, so but that's that's the plan. Any thoughts or questions? Stuff from before from Tuesday. All right. So let, let's do let's do this. Um, so I'm Bogdan. I'm an associate professor here. I'll start. Um, I've been at CMU since 2016. Um, I was a postdoc at University of California Davis before. Uh, I got my PhD in the Netherlands in a place called Eindhoven, the Eindhoven, Eindhoven University of Technology. Uh, I grew up and was born in Romania, so I've been traveling around uh, the world. Um, I do research at the intersection of software engineering and societal computing, which are two PhD programs here in the School of Computer Science. You will see that my PhD students in my group are, you know, depending on the time, uh, more or less equally split between the two programs. Uh, you know, again, as evidence that my research kind of spans the two uh, disciplines. Uh, and we do a lot of empirical research, um, recently focusing on open source online communities, you know, trying to understand how they work, trying to understand how to best or better uh, support and sustain them, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and that involves all kinds of research methods, empirical, you know, ranging from qualitative to quantitative. Uh, which I will be sharing with you all as part of this class. That's that's me. Uh, we'll do this in some random order, and then whoever introduces themselves can pass it on to a random other person that you choose. Okay, let's start with Ian. All right, my name is Ian. Um, so I'm a second year PhD student. My research area is in formal techniques, so I work in like model checking and robustness. Um, I know very little about empirical methods, but I think it's valuable. So I'm taking this course to learn about it and I'm really hoping to learn how to read ICSI papers. And I'm gonna hand it off to Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Uh, this is my second year as a PhD student. Before this, I was working for five years for the government. Um, I am currently doing research to try to make uh, getting distributed systems less horrible. Um, I am currently like writing a tool for fault injection testing for resilience engineering, uh, targeting WASM for the instrumentation in that one. Um, and this course is gonna be helpful because I'm trying to create developer tooling and Creating developer tooling in a way that developers want to use it is important, especially if you're putting it into testing, which developers already hate. So making sure that it's doing it in a meaningful like, useful way. Uh, yeah. Trent. Hey, I'm Trent. Uh, I joined CMU in about 2014. I'm uh, primarily a staff robotics engineer, uh, but I'm here because uh, technically I'm a software engineering PhD student as a hobby. I'm kind of doing it for the bit. Uh, I uh, do have some upcoming research on how people test robots, where we're looking at doing um, interview studies or uh, looking at uh, a problem where we really do not know much of anything about uh, across the industry. How do folks actually handle some of the problems that come when you try and put software into the real world and embody it. Um, so excited to see how uh, I can be better at working on those kind of problems. Uh, and I think these guys are cheating by naming people they know. So I'm just gonna kind of close my eyes and go in sort of that direction. Good job. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Long. I, uh, I'm a first year PhD student. 
and uh, I did my undergrad graduate studies at uh, UCLA, where I became interested in uh, programming language research. And then I worked as a software developer at a startup for, for three years. Uh, and the most interesting task I worked work on there was on the firmware for a payment card, and which sparked my interest in formal methods and formal verifications. Uh, and so I am working, my research is on uh, deductive program verification with Jonathan Aldrich. Um, the reason why this course is interesting to me is because I want to, my long term goal, ambition is to make uh, formal verification more practical and more use and more, more popular in industry. And I want to learn why, what are the reasons why it is not, and make tools that are, uh, and, and, mix, and do studies uh, with uh, real developers to make uh, tools that are actually usable by real developers in, in industry. Thanks. So you'll see me um, just writing down notes about the kinds of things you're hoping to get so I can you know, think about how I can best help you and what kinds of things to include or not in the course later on um, to, you know, serve your interest. That's what you're seeing me scribble down. Um, otherwise, please continue. Thank you, Bunk. Um, um, okay. And uh, and, 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 and so I'm like, I'm excited to basically learn, learn more about how, how, to, how to do these kinds of empirical, empirical studies with real users. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's a you, you, uh, what's your name? My name's Taylor. So, everyone, my name's Taylor. <clears throat> I'm a master's student actually in the INI, which is a cybersecurity program in the College of Engineering. Um, I'm taking this class because I'm interested in doing research revolving around cybersecurity education and how that can be used to lift people out of poverty um, because computer science and cybersecurity provide very stable jobs. So um, I'm going to be doing an empirical study. So that's, uh, that's why I'm taking this course. And I came straight from undergrad. So I did my undergrad at the University of Wyoming in computer science. And now I'm doing my master's in information security. Uh, so I'll pick you and the pink sweatpants because I like pink. Hello, everyone. I'm Paul. I'm a first year PhD student in software engineering. And I am very interested, interested in software supply chain and sometimes the societal aspect of open source software development. And these two research fields would require a lot of empirical studies like how to quantify the impact of certain development practice or software supply chain security, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason I'm taking this course is because although I have had some research experiences before, I have never taken a systematic research method course. So I hope to, I hope I can make use this course as a chance to kind of consolidate what I have learned in the past and develop a systematic understanding of all the research methods that I can use for my future studies. Let me just pick someone here, Claudia. Uh, hi, I'm Claudia. Uh, I'm from Portugal. I'm a first year PhD student here. It's a rare course. Welcome, Claudia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a first uh, year PhD student here and a second year in Portugal. Uh, I'm currently working with Claire uh, on how to explore deep learning and explainability to improve vulnerability detection and repair. And I'm now conducting an empirical study, so I hope I can use this course to improve that. Want to take it? What are you trying to do? I will go with Rishi. Uh, hi, I'm Michi. I'm a first year PhD student in uh, software engineering. Um, I guess before this, I was a full stack engineer at Tableau Salesforce. Um, graduated from uh, my undergrad with a degree in software engineering as well. Um, my research is mainly focused on diagrams at the moment. Um, interested in like interactive, um, interactive diagrams or diagrams that illustrate a changed object. 
all the time or, you know, through some process. Um, so I'm currently working on a tool to create interactive illustrations of geometry proofs. Um, this is research I'm doing with Josh Sunshine and Dominic Moritz and HCRI. Um, so I'm taking this course because I know a little bit about empirical methods at a high level, but I haven't um, personally like evaluated any of my own research before. So um, hoping to get more hands-on experience with that. And I've also, um, we've just, my advisors and I have discussed doing a user study. Um, so I would like to learn more about um, the techniques I can employ for Great, thank you. I'll go to Alma. Hi, I'm Sean. Uh, I, I majored in, uh, well, I, I, I had a computer science major in undergrad, but um, I, I got done with that during like the first two years of my undergrad, so I spent most of my undergrad on like linguistics, actually, mm -hmm. or at least most of what I like, like spent my time on was linguistics towards the end. Um, uh, let's see, about myself. I like cats. Wait, that's not... Uh, <laughs> I like types. Um, I, I work on uh, programming languages and, and human computer interaction. So I, I like I I work on stuff to make uh, to take a bunch of fancy type theory uh, and make it like into like something that does like something cool uh, and like um, that that makes like programming less of like a like an awful process for like uh, people um, who don't know any type theory, uh, which is like most people. Um, let's see. Right now, I'm working on. Uh, I'm working on like two things. Uh, I'm working on this like tool for information flow control, which is like a like a security analysis kind of. Uh, I'm, al I'm also working on making on like a like a programming languages approach to front app debugging. Uh, so like, I mean, I don't, I don't know about like everyone's like programming's like practices in this room, but I suspect that most of you use print for debugging like uh, pretty often. Uh, except like printf is kind of just this like thing that exists in like all programming languages, but the, but that gets like no attention from like the PL community. Um, I feel like if if you integrate it with the type system and, and do like certain things with it, there's like a lot more you can do. Like you should be able to print stuff, right? Like like you should be able to take a take a when you, when you print something normally, you take something that has structure and you, and you destroy all that structure and you and you and you send it to standard out. If you instead retain that structure, you can do things like, you know, I can click inside the value that I printed and like replace it and have the rest of the print statements up for an update so that with the with the with the new value corresponding to that corresponding to that execution. Cool. Um, stuff like that. Uh, and to and to evaluate whether whether any of this is like worthwhile, uh, I have to like to use user studies. So that's like the pitch. Cool. Thank you. Don't be shy. Uh, Yep. So I'm Ilya. Uh, I'm a first year PhD student at software engineering. Um, I had my undergrad in Michigan where I studied computer science and data science. And uh, right now, I'm, my research is on the use of diagrams mm. and the formal methods. So I'm advised by Ansak and Josh. Mm. And uh, most specifically, how, how to use like uh, domain specific visualizations and diagrams to improve on like uh, user experience of formal methods tools like Alloy and maybe other tools. So I, I like to take this course because uh, uh, somewhere in the future, we are planning to make, do like some studies of users or uh, like what users actually want from like visualizations of formal models. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And also if you do have come up with a tool, if you do come up with a tool that can automatically generate some diagrams, you want to be able to evaluate how users like it. And that's why I want to. That's why I want to take away from this course. Mm. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, hi everyone. I'm Ian. I'm second year software engineering PhD. Uh, my research is mainly I'm mainly interested in the software engineering for AI, like how to improve the reliability, robustness of the AI system. Uh, the reason I want to take this course is mainly because like. In the last like last few projects like uh, I have ever done, like I made a lot of problems. Like how to form a very great, I mean, like, a proper research question. And what kind of method I should take to approach to answer that research question. Also, sometimes 
uh, for example, the last time I, I developed a tool, but like, how do you evaluate it? Like, is it quantitative or qualitative? So I feel like empirical master, like, I need to like systematically learn something and in other future, future research, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Harrison? Um, yeah, so I'm Harrison. I'm a second year PhD student working with Fraser Brown. Uh, I'm mainly interested in like automated vulnerability discovery. Uh, specifically, I'm working on fuzzing. Uh, also interested in like reverse engineering tools. So, uh, you know, understanding decompiled code, things like that. Um, let's see, before my PhD, I worked as a vulnerability researcher. Um, so I was primarily just like spent like eight months trying to reverse engineer like a specific type of router, which just involved like reading a bunch of like compiled C++ code and trying to understand what that was happening. Um, and I've noticed uh, there's sort of like this disconnect. We have a lot of cool like research happening in academia with um, like decompilation and reverse engineering, but then in practice, a lot of people are sort of not using it or they're using sort of like hand rule tools. And so I'm sort of interested, I think from this course, it'd be cool to figure out some sort of studies to understand like what's happening with this disconnect. Um, I think sometimes it's more of like a usability thing, like the tools coming out of academia are just like not, I don't know, not mature enough or something, but um, I think maybe sometimes they're just addressing the wrong problem entirely. So. Uh, let's see. Hello, I'm Luis. Um, I'm from Portugal. Um, my name is Luis from uh, Portugal. I graduated um, in machine learning and data science. Um, and um, I'm working with Jonathan in the research. Um, and my research is about uh, converting end to end diagrams uh, to runnable code. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, we already have a prototype that will take an image uh, and will convert it uh, into a Jupyter notebook. So, for example, we, we have a um, machine learning pipeline and uh, it will give us uh, the Jupyter notebook. Um, and my interest in this uh, course is precisely because I want to start testing this, uh, this tool and the empirical studies with it first uh, to discover which this, um, which um, patterns, sketching patterns, developers are already using. Um, and second, to see which of those patterns um, perform better and, and generate better. Code. And now, I'm going to that side. Yeah. Hello, my name is Owen. I'm a, a societal computing second year PhD. Uh, I mainly do, uh, well, my undergrad was uh, at George Washington University in computer science, and I, uh, my research interests are user studies. All of my research projects are about uh, learning how users react to different things, such as uh, privacy dashboards. Uh, and also um, how online tracking affects uh, users. Oh, uh, I'm taking this course because uh, although there are bits of things I learned by doing um, research projects, I've never uh, systematically learned how to do a research from beginning to end. So hopefully I'll learn that. Yes, yeah, so likewise, we, we do. Thank you. Uh, hey everyone, uh, I'm on, I'm a second year PhD student in finance at Tupper. Uh, I'm working on the inflation expectations and firms investments, so it's more theory side, but I'm very much interested in the empirical uh, aspects of things which I'm not really familiar with no. yet. Uh, so I would very much like to learn more about that and also, uh, as my friend has said, moving from the beginning till the end of uh, coming up with the research question, so like uh, figuring out to test that and how to interpret that. Um, before the PhD, I did master's in Portugal uh, at NOLA. Uh, and also wanted to make some people that I was an income engineering. Uh, also, Romanian descent. Uh, is really good. Great. We should talk more about this. Absolutely. Yeah, I love it. So, your work probably involves a lot of quantitative modeling. Right. So, I think in Tepper, the students usually get really good training on all of these. So you know, maybe you can teach the rest of us something. I can. Absolutely. That'd be great. Th thanks, for, thanks for coming.
Um, my name is Kaya. I'm a first year software engineering PhD student. Um, I graduated from the University of Michigan uh, last year. Got my undergrad in computer science. Um, I like crosswords. Uh, my research, I, I'm working um, with Andy Bagel. Um, I particularly am interested in uh, accessibility for neurodivergent developers, um, developer well-being, and I also really like program comprehension. Um, and basically, I'm stuck in the never-ending loop of like. Uh, empirical research, mm -hmm. like exploratory question, let's confirm this relationship, let's build a tool and evaluate it just over and over again. Um, so that's why I'm in this course, because I think it's going to be very valuable because the great majority of my projects are going to include some empirical component. Um, and something that I'm looking to get out of this course in particular is that I am very uncomfortable with ambiguity in choosing methods and I never expect that to go away like you said um it depends but I think I yeah <laughs> I think um there's just so many methods out there and I'm great at learning how to use methods but I don't know which how to choose mm. so that's why I'm here and I also need more quantitative skills what's the record on the New York Times pressure puzzle um like fastest i don't know how many you were able to solve or something in a year oh um i do most of the puzzles although i cheat sometimes uh i like usually do one a day at least um but my fastest i think was five minutes one day when i was trying yeah. I, that doesn't mean anything to anyone but <laughs> So my wife does uh, the puzzles, and she tells me they're often very hard. Mm -hmm. She's impressed with people that you know always solve. Mm -hmm. I know them best from her. My favorite is the Thursday because uh, it's really tricky. Like uh, there's always a like a subliminal theme that like there aren't really rules for, and you have to figure out the rules as you go along. Thursday puzzle. I will. Uh, I'll talk to her about this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Is anybody that hasn't gone yet? Yes, please. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Katerina. Uh, I'm a PhD student in software engineering, doing a dual PhD also here in and in Portugal. I did my undergrad and master's in Lisbon, uh, and now I'm here. What is my research? It's related to programming languages, reification, and usability, which together might be a little bit weird, especially uh, because sometimes people in these areas don't really care about usability. So usually we really care about new techniques, how to make programs more reliable, but we forget that people actually need to use and be able to use these techniques. So in my research, I'm trying to combine these two things. I've done some user studies in the past. I'm doing some uh, user studies now and some in the future, um, hopefully more, well, a little bit mixed methods. So some quantitative, some qualitative, uh, and besides what everyone has said at they want to learn more about uh, all of these methods that I also want to. One thing that I would really like to get out of this course would be how to really convince people that are more positivist in the philosophical um, worldviews that this kind of research, more qualitative, is also important. And that in these areas of verification and programming languages, uh, we should care more about developers. Thank you. I think that's it. We've heard from everybody. Great, thanks a lot. It's nice to meet you. Hopefully um, you'll find this class useful. Uh, I think you'll find at least some aspects of this class useful. Um, really interesting, I heard a bunch of interesting themes. So I guess one meta comment since we're on a rant. Um, I think you can be very successful in um, doing empirical research in fields where traditionally there hasn't been as much empirical research or as sophisticated empirical research. Um, it, you know, it may take a while to convince the community with your papers that this work is useful and valuable and important. But once you overcome that initial hurdle, I think you can have great impact. You know, looking back at, I don't know, the never ending 
rivalry between the field of programming languages and software engineering. Um, I think software engineering was earlier in its appreciation for empirical research than programming languages was. Um, and in the, I don't know, sophistication of the empirical studies that people were doing and whatnot. Um, so I think you, know, you could have, you could probably still make a killing, you know, doing full sophisticated empirical research in PL. Uh, I think historically they've been a little uh, farther behind uh, in the sense. Similarly, you know, in software engineering, we're going to talk more about this throughout the semester. My estimate is that we're at least 20 years behind, say, you know, fields like economics in terms of our quantitative analysis sophistication, 20 years at least. Um, so, I, you know, I think you can make a killing in empirical software engineering research by literally just stealing these cool uh, analysis methods and whatnot uh, that people are using in other fields. And applying them, to, you know, to problems in in your respective field, uh, we've done a lot of this in my group uh, very successfully. You know, people have always liked our papers when we've done this, um, and it's always been theft, really. Uh, like we don't really invent these new methods, but we recognize that you know they exist and they're useful, and we apply them to a problem that people care about in, in our field, uh, and that usually is very uh, highly appreciated. So, meta comment, you know. This can be very useful if, if done right. All right, so let me stop here with this part uh, and move on. I wanna talk about our main uh, topic for today, which is formulating research questions. And you know, hopefully it's obvious why we start here because all of our studies start with some question or set of questions, you know, and then we go figure out what methods do we need to use to answer those questions. And then we execute on that plan and whatnot and we keep doing this over and over again. Uh, so that's why we're also starting here. So I will introduce you to two characters, first of which is Jane. Please meet Jane. Jane is hiding behind, there's no mouse that I can see. Jane is there in the corner. I don't have a mouse cursor, so I don't know how to move that little thing. Corner. There's Jane, there you go. Hi, Jane. Um, Jane is, um, a researcher in computer science. Um, and her intuition here is that the fish eye view file navigator, which you know we can see a prototype of um, on the right hand side here, is more efficient than a traditional file navigator. So fish uh, fish eye view um, zooms in more, uses a bigger typeface for stuff that is in focus and a progressively smaller one, the, you know, the farther away you get from where you're hovering, I guess. Uh, kind of similar to the Mac, whatever, uh, bar at the bottom, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, and the intuition is based on this observation that fa file navigation requires a lot of scrolling uh, and lots of clicks to find the right files. Um, and this format is more compact well, because the font size is smaller for some of these other things. So the whole thing is more compact, so you can fit more things on the screen. So, you know, in theory, uh, that should or could reduce the amount of scrolling required. Okay. So that's Jane's intuition, and he's looking to um, do research in this and find some evidence whether this is the case or not. Uh, and, you know, people can also counter argue that. This is more difficult to read, you know, except for the few things that have a big enough font size, you can't really tell what's, uh, you know, uh, what the other things are. So it's not very usable, difficult to read. Um, and, uh, you know, people won't adopt it anyway, just because there's a lot of inertia. You know, we've been doing file navigation in one way forever, and it's just going to be very hard to overcome that. People are used to doing things a certain way, even if it's not necessarily the best way. Uh, but it's just, you know, it's been so long, it's been around for so long that it's going to be very hard to change. Okay, so, you know, this is an open question. Is this, is this a good idea? Right. Uh, so Jane sets out to collect evidence to support or refute this intuition. Okay, so this is Jane. Um, how would you summarize in my research question what Jane is trying to do? I want everybody to write down if you have a device or a piece of paper, you know, at least one research question, summarizing 
uh, this plan of genes. Formulate a research question as if as if you were to write it down in a research paper or a dissertation or something. How would you summarize or describe Jane's research? What question uh, could Jane have asked? Uh, write one down, or you know, several if you have more ideas. At least one down, and keep this to yourself. We're going to come back to this uh, in a few minutes. Okay. Do you have an idea? Do you have a draft? Do you have a question or more? Yes, mostly. Okay, good. All right. So now let's meet Joe. Joe is friends with me, uh, but Joe is working on something else. Joe is interested in how engineers or software developers in practice and industry use or not. Uh, UML diagrams during software design. Um, so, you know, if you're uh, not familiar with this, UML is that unified modeling language is some sort of diagramming standard or language um, for drawing software design related diagrams. This is an example of one. Um, it's taught in lots of universities. You know, I occasionally teach a course on software design that includes teaching about UML uh, drawings. Uh, lots of people do in lots of other places. You know, academics tend to like this. Uh, uh, but uh, Joe went off to do a summer internship at Evil Core. Uh, and there, uh, anecdotally, uh, based on his experience, you know, nobody was using UML diagrams uh, in practice. So there seems to be this disconnect, you know, uh, academics like this, uh, students get taught this in courses, but it doesn't seem like uh, engineers actually use this in practice. So um, Joe is trying to explore how widely used UML diagrams are in industry. Okay, very reasonable, you know, not dissimilar to things we've heard. Um, particularly how these diagrams are being used as collaborative shared artifacts during software design, you know, meaning do designers or engineers use these kind of diagrams to collaborate on the design and iterate on the design of some piece of software. So now, how, you know, what question, write down a question or two similar to Jane uh, that, excuse me, that describes Joe's uh, research program. What question is Joe asking? Could be asking, should be asking. Okay, so here are two questions that I had written down here, um, summarizing Jane and Joe's scenarios. Jane might be asking, is a fisheye file view, sorry, fisheye view file navigator more efficient than the traditional view for file navigation? 
And then Joe might be asking, how widely are UML diagrams being used as collaborative shared artifacts during software design? Any thoughts on these questions? Let's start with James. Anything that, uh, is, what comes to mind uh, about James' question? The word efficient could mean many different things in this context. Uh, is Jane interested in how quickly a particular task is done as, or how few mistakes people make across a variety of tasks? There's a lot of dimensions that are getting squashed out here. Mm. Yeah, it's a great observation. Lots of ambiguity and, you know, the use of this word efficient. So presumably, you know, the paper here would have to very clearly define and explain and articulate what is being summarized by this word efficiency. That's the case. Right. Yes. Why are we looking at efficiency file navigator? Like, um, what is there research to support that it might be we're looking into or that like, hasn't succeeded in some other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so where does this even come from? Mm -hmm. um, is the is the task of file navigation something that is a pain point for developers? Is it something that's that they're taking a lot of time on, or is it something that they, they, they don't take, take a lot of time? They don't really don't feel like that it could be improved. Right, great, great observation. You know, so how much of a problem is this really? Like, are we really working on the right problem here? Like, is, is this even painful in the first place? Is it inefficient? Whatever efficiency might mean, is it inefficient? Is it worth improving upon? Uh, are people bothered by this? Or, you know, is this something that Jane thinks is a good idea, but maybe no one else? Elizabeth? The question doesn't give the context. Like, it doesn't even talk about her wanting to look at this specifically with developers. Oh, right. It's like, who is doing the file navigation? You know, what context is this being asked in? Right, right. Great, great observation also. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, I'm curious, like, what you pick is the traditional view. It's like, even on a computer now, there's, like, lots of different applications and it's, like, variations. Right, right. And, you know, people use different kinds of views already. Like, what, what does traditional even mean? How widespread is, is whatever, you know, way of navigating probably a variety of them they were probably you know differently popular what does traditional mean okay yeah anything else uh, i also feel like like this research question will only be answers yeah. like yes or no which is less interesting than asking specifically like how much and how much more efficiency the specific amount there great right so the way the question is phrased at most, you can expect a yes or no, but even if it's a yes, by a teeny tiny margin, you know, maybe it doesn't matter, right? So yes, you know, dramatically uh, more efficient, maybe much more interesting and important and valuable to establish than yes, net by a negligible margin, right? Because then, you know, you have to get people unused to something they've been doing forever for little apparent gain. Great observation. Thank you. Anything else? I think you Chris said a little about that, like about what trade offs uh, could come with uh, implementing that efficient view at what cost it, it will come. Great. So, like, are we losing anything by doing this? Right. So, you know, maybe this is slightly more efficient. You know, who knows? Maybe Jane establishes that. But are there any costs? Are there any trade offs? Are we losing anything in the, in the process of changing to this radically different way of navigating? Yeah, great. Any else? Very good criticism so far. Let, let's look at Joe's. What do you think about Joe's? Um, it only asks like how widely used UML diagrams are. I feel like that's not a very like interesting question because, well, in my mind, usage doesn't correlate to like, you know, like, it, like, like what what's actually. You know, like it, like does this actually like does this help you like form like a shared mental model of what it is you're doing, or you know, you know anything like that? It's just you know, like maybe your boss told you to use it, like maybe that's why you're doing it. Like that's not the. See, it seems it seems maybe not as well targeted as it could be. So maybe how useful it is is something that you know you would be more interested in, as opposed to just how widely used it is. Yeah, 
Thanks. Please. Um, I guess it's a bit different again. That's why, like, the word widely, it's kind of vague. I, I read it like, how often were mail diagrams I used on collaborate, collaboration meetings? Mm. Uh, so that's something more concrete. Mm. Yeah. Um, so here is the widely word that's more, more ambiguity in the phrasing. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yes. So, yeah, uh, regarding the word, how widely. Um, I think there are two two definitions. One is like what percentage of teams use this. Mm. The other is like how much time does a team spend using this. Mm. So it's kind of like with efficiency earlier with Jane, like all kinds of ways in which this could be interpreted. So presumably, you know, the paper here would have to very clearly articulate and define those, right? even if you end up summarizing it. And, and this very concise way, you have to very clearly define what that means, what it is you're actually uh, just being. By the way, this, just as a quick aside, uh, I mentioned the thing uh, in the previous lecture on Tuesday that in my experience, the number one reason why research papers get rejected uh, when you submit them for publication um, is this disconnect between the evidence you're providing and the claims you're making in the paper more than anything else. So similarly here, you know, you're, you're maybe overclaiming based on how you write up your results, but the evidence does not support that. You know, you, maybe you show something very narrow, but you claim something very general. This often gets people very upset when they're reviewing groups. Okay, and end of the slide. What else about the question? Yes. Uh, this kind of reminds me of one of the papers that you suggested, like where they have a set of rules and try to verify are they applied like in practice. And they came to the conclusion that it depends on the values of the company. Mm -hmm. So I guess this question is maybe like too broad because it won't provide the answer for what we are looking like. For example, here we should maybe focus on like a specific um target mm -hmm. because it depends on the value so i don't know it seems like it mm -hmm. yep 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 thanks uh i, I had trent earlier oh uh, yeah i was just gonna say uh one way to get more narrow on the how widely uh might be to <clears throat> frame it in terms of <laughs> i had a note of something like a, which tasks are folks choosing uml trying to find patterns um not just looking at the percentage, but looking at, you know, are there uh, patterns to usage? Are there rules of thumb that people are using when they're deciding when to commit things to UML or not? Mm -hmm. Yes, great. I had a couple more. Marina, Marina. Yeah, I can go. Um, I'm also not sure about the focus on UML because there should be a way that developers share their insights and make their decisions and document them. Mm -hmm. uh, that might not be UML, but very similar. So, and that information would completely be lost in a question like this. Yep. So maybe if it was changed for something more broad, like how do they communicate design decisions uh, instead of just focusing on UML, they could get more answers. Right. Because, you know, this could, if they don't, uh, if the study finds that people don't use UML, you know, the implication would be that people don't do any design, whereas they could do lots of design in different ways that don't involve UML. Yes. Yeah, I was basically going to say what Kevin said, because it seems also that, like the motivation for this is like, is how students are educated actually mapping to how the real world works. Um, and so it would be helpful to have a better idea of the artifacts that are produced during the design process so if they're educated in a way that's relevant to how water works. Yep, thanks. Any more? <clears throat> Great discussion, lovely, lively crowd, I love it. Yeah. Um, on the previous slide, Evil Corp said that UML is not useful. Is that what they're basically trying to figure out? Not useful, just not useful. Ah, rarely used, okay. No claim has been made about usefulness. Okay. I guess you can read into it that it's not useful, they're not using it, but I, I'm not claiming that. Gotcha. Because if you're trying to figure out usefulness, of course, this question is not really useful at all. But I guess that's part of the motivation. You know, academics are pushing this presumably because they think it's useful. 
but then practitioners don't end up using it. They're missing out on the usefulness, you know. Your... Right. Because if you care about that, you might not just care about how widely used it is. You might care about whether a team will use it again. But I don't know. It depends on what you're trying to figure out. Yep. Any more on this? It's like, look how two arguably very you know, simple questions can raise so many questions from, from the audience, from the readers. And so I'm, by the way, I, I don't, the goal of you know taking this class is not for you to now obsess over every single word you ever write in you know all future papers and whatnot and never finish them. Okay, so that is that is absolutely not the goal. You know, I realize that I'm maybe steering you a little bit in this direction. Uh, that's not the intention. But you know, I some healthy dose of skepticism and reflection is useful. Uh, I think. Do finish your papers. Okay, so uh, I guess the point here um, is that the most obvious question isn't always the best choice as a starting point in a research program. Um, so you know, here, you know, the question that Jane and, and Joe asked um, were okay, but they weren't maybe maybe the best choice as a starting point. So let's look a little bit more systematically at, at how to think about uh, questions and how to phrase different kinds of questions. Um, you all raised a lot of this criticism already. You know, do we know that some people need to do file navigation? How much of a problem is that? Who are these people that do that? Uh, what does it mean exactly to do file navigation? What counts and what doesn't count as file navigation? Under what circumstances do people do file navigation? Um, how do you measure efficiency and is that a relevant goal for this target audience? Okay, so some, some questions similar to the ones you asked. Uh, similarly for Joe, what even is a collaborative shared artifact? As before, what counts as one? What doesn't count as one? Uh, can we reliably identify one? Can we know one when we see one? Can we find all instances of these? Uh, how reliably can we even say uh, which things are and are in UML diagrams. You know, I mentioned there's a particular syntax and format and structure to these diagrams. What if you deviate from that? You know, do you still count them as UML diagrams or, or not? You know, like all of these kinds of questions that change the scope and the interpretation of your <laughs> Um So both questions are vague because they make all kinds of assumptions about the phenomena to be studied. Uh, and the kinds of situations in which these phenomena occur. And the lesson here is to try to minimize uh, or avoid making such assumptions, or at the very, very least, if you cannot avoid that, to make the assumptions explicit. If you cannot avoid making them, at least make them explicit so that your readers can contextualize the, the claims you're making. So, okay, so let's look at uh, different ways Joe and Jane could have asked their research questions. Maybe better ways. So, for example, there could have been exploratory questions um, getting at the existence of a certain phenomenon. So is file navigation something that software developers actually do in practice? Is this something that actually happens, or is this a made up uh, scenario, made up problem? Uh, is efficiency actually a problem? Are people complaining for whatever? Do we have evidence that the current practice is insufficiently efficient that, that it can be improved upon? Um, do that's for Jane. For Joe, no. Do these collaborative shared artifacts actually exist? Do people get together and share artifacts when they're designing and discussing software? So exploratory questions that try to get at the existence of a certain phenomenon or practice or you know what happens. Um, you could ask descriptive style questions or questions that try to classify uh, things. How can we measure efficiency for file navigation? This is sort of a descriptive style question. Or what are all the types of collaborative shared artifacts? 
this is a classification style question. You know, the outcome of this could be some taxonomy of such uh, collaborative shared artifacts. Um, or you could ask descriptive comparative questions. Uh, how do fish eye views differ from conventional views, whatever conventional means? You know, maybe you want to make this even more precise, uh, have something concrete there. Um, how do UML diagrams differ from other representations of design information? Um, I am have been over the past summer and I'm still part-time currently visiting Google. Um, and uh, in my experience at Google, everybody writes design documents, or Google Docs writes extensive design documents at the beginning of every project of, of every kind. Uh, but these documents don't necessarily have, you know, diagrams or even UML diagrams. But they do have a lot of, you know, the rationale behind the, the things people choose to do and, you know, al alternatives they've explored and discarded and all kinds of things like that. Um, you know, so that's arguably a collaborative shared design artifact. It has nothing to do with diagramming. Uh, so, you know, kind of establishing how UML fits in this greater context of what people actually do uh, in practice uh, seems uh, relevant. So the outcomes of something like this, you know, clear understanding of the phenomena, more precise definition of the theoretical terms of the concepts, uh, evidence that we can even measure these things before we can argue about more or less efficient, you know, might be important to establish the validity of measuring this efficiency in the first place. Um, by the way, uh, quick aside, so you know, already you can maybe see you know, so let's say you come in and you say, well, but I, I you know, I want to measure how much more efficient people become with this fish eye view navigation. And you're telling me now that I have to go back to, I don't know, the roots in the 1800s and the Greeks and whatever, and, you know, start from, you know, first principles. So, you know, I will never get to do the thing I actually want to do. I'll, you know, end up losing years doing all these side things before I even get to do anything interesting. How do you feel about this? What's the uh, what's the solution? <laughs> Read up other people work. Read up other people work. Read up <laughs> right. So you know, ideally, uh, ideally, there's a lot of prior work you can build on. So, so hopefully, others have done a lot of this work for you. Right, that would be great. What else? Well, this was a question I had when I was doing the reading. Um, another ambiguous thing like how many questions do you need to have answered at each level before you like move on to the next one yeah this comes up every year when i talk about research yeah. questions this question comes up every time what what do you think you know how how much of this extra work do you have to do before you get to do the thing you actually want to do You had a good point, you know, maybe a lot of this is covered by prior work, ideally, like, you know, try to find all of the prior work you can and build on that so you don't have to redo a lot of this, do it firsthand. So definitely that, right? I'm fully on board. What else? I don't know the answer to the question, but kind of building up what you said, if prior work doesn't exist, you might have a chance for a more fundamental co uh, contribution to the field. Like, instead of asking about if, like if you're not bar, you could, you know, do a research study about is navigation something that certain types of programmers actually do, and that's probably more useful. Mm -hmm. But what if you really, you know, don't want to do that because you don't find it interesting for whatever reason? You assume. <laughs> you assume. You assume. Yes. One thing is, uh, for some of these questions, like you can kind of do that while you are doing the actual, like. Actual, while well, you are answering the question that you actually want to answer, like if you do an experiment, like if you try to do an experiment of the fish eye, uh, fish eye lens browsing stuff, like is file navigation something that some programmers actually do? Like if you observe the programmer and you give them two types of, like one of the two types of uh, uh, file browsers, then you can actually observe whether they actually use the, you can actually observe whether they actually use the, use the browsers where, where they actually uh, actually navigate the files. Great, but then you get, you know, 20 people if you're lucky for an hour in a research lab, you know, the extent to which that experience translates to usefulness in the wild, 
long, long gap there. Yes. Well, I had two of those. One, you can do something else that has a lot of background information that people are already asking a lot of questions around if you want to do like some niche topic or if you want to do a really high risk, like high reward study, you could create the like fisheye navigation experiment, but you'd have to be really confident that you think it's going to work because I think the null, like if it comes out null, like it doesn't really mean anything. Yeah, I agree with this. Yeah, her. I think maybe part of it is you need enough of these questions to be able to convince yourself or convince other people of what you're doing. Uh, like I think if you don't ask any of these questions and you just do like a quantitative study of some tool, then you're kind of risking just like being in the blind and missing some phenomena that's happening. Uh, so it's just, just enough to convince yourself. Okay, so it's, but that's the hard part. The just enough part is the hard part. Like figuring out what is just enough. Um, so, you know, it's really, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't actually have an answer to this. Um, it's really frustrating that, you know, in order to do science, you have to do a lot of art. In a way, like you know, you, I think of science as being, you know, fundamentally very different from arts. But in the process of you know doing science, you have to do a lot of art. You have to decide what is just enough. You know, like how, you know, what is it that you can reasonably assume, uh, take for granted, and you know, what is it that you have to go back and redo from first principles and so on. And that's that's an art. I, I don't know that we know how to, how to do that. That's why. I guess that's why people have, you know, more experienced PhD advisors and whatnot that maybe have a better taste for what it means. <laughs> where you talk to colleagues or you get feedback and peer reviews. But it's really, personally, I find this very frustrating, you know, because there's so much subjectivity and art in the course of doing science. You also try to reify it as like an instance of another problem. Right, so like if, if, if some if some aspect of what you're interested in about that like to do with um like file takers has to do with is is related to like you know navigating websites in some way or something and there's a bunch of research on like accessibility for, for like websites, right? Yeah, great. Like you could you could you could like like repurpose that in your context, even though it's like this is a great point. So uh, Tuesday we're gonna talk about the role of theory. I I label what you're describing. You know, casting something as an instance of something else, I labeled that as essentially, you know, reusing some grander theory, uh, abstraction. Uh, so we're going to talk on Tuesday a lot more about this, and I agree with you. That is a good strategy. Uh, but the high level point is, it's hard to do this. I, I don't have I don't have a solution that will you know just get you get you the answer every time. Why? That's why it's this hard. Um, okay, back to our uh, story here. Kind of moving up in the style of questions that you could ask, uh, you know, after you've established the existence of something, or maybe classified something, you could ask frequency and base rate style questions. How many of these kinds of diagrams are created during software uh, development projects in large software companies, for example? Would be a kind of question you would ask. Um, or uh, how do programmers navigate files using existing tools? Something that describes a process uh, people actually follow, yeah, maybe the frequency of this. Um, and this can be very useful uh, because it gives you an empirical basis um, for knowing whether something is typical or unusual. Okay? Uh, because presumably the unusual things are things that are, you know, maybe you want to optimize or, or whatever. Know, or maybe they're interesting to learn from. So the ones that are doing things, the majority of people that are doing things in a different way can learn from these few that are doing things differently and everybody can get better at something. Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe the few outliers are doing things in the wrong way and you know, they shouldn't improve uh, on their practices. Well, whatever it may be, kind of knowing what is typical and unusual, uh, normal and abnormal, if you will, uh, so is useful. Uh, um, next up still, you can begin asking, you know, so once you know about the existence of something, you know about its frequency, you can begin asking about relationships between phenomena. So for example, does efficiency in file navigation correlate with the programmer's familiarity with the programming environment? So now you're talking about the relationship between two concepts. 
efficiency and navigation and familiarity with programming environments. Presumably, the more familiar you are with the tool, the more efficient you are, like, irrespective of you know how the tool works. So you just you've used it more, so you're more aware of uh, how to be efficient with it. Yeah. But, but if you're trying to compare the efficiency of two different, uh, say, file navigation tools, then, uh, then for the same programmer with the same familiarity with the program environment, like as long as each, like as long as you can compare them, like um, as long as you have the same familiarity, then it doesn't quite matter. Right? Okay, great. But you said something really important here. You said for the same programmer with the same familiarity with the programming environment. I see. So in, in what you said, you're embedding an assumption. You're embedding the assumption that familiarity with the programming environment is in fact correlated with efficiency and is something one should control for. So that you know, if you want to establish that one type of navigation is more efficient than another, you need to add a variable of familiarity. You, like you need to control, you need to fix you know, the familiarity with the programming environment. So you're embedding this assumption that these two things, sorry, that, that familiarity with the programming environment is correlated with the outcome in, in your claim, which is something that you can get from the literature. Okay? Maybe people have established this. Um, <laughs> Or instead, if nobody has ever talked about this, you know, maybe something you should establish if you have some good reason to suspect that it may be true. It does. Make sense? But that's exactly the point. You know, if you want to, if you really want to show that it is the uh, the uh, fisheye view that improves efficiency, you want to isolate, you want to exclude the effect of familiarity with the programming environment. Okay, so we'll talk a lot more about you know quantum inference later on. All right, another question. Do managers claims about how often they use UML correlate with the actual use of UML? There's been a series of, uh, I don't know, interesting papers that I've read in, in software engineering uh, along the lines of belief versus evidence, you know, about all kinds of phenomena. Like, I don't know, uh, programmers or managers or whoever, you know, X group believes something, uh, but the empirical evidence, you know, points in the exact opposite direction. You know, why, why is it that we believe things that are uh, empirically unsupported and so on? And what are these things that we you know, tend to believe the opposite effects for than, uh, than the evidence suggests? So anyway, useful kind of uh, question to ask. Right, and um, this is arguably a first step uh, before uh, causality-like questions. You know, if you want to establish that fisheye views cause, and I'm careful with my words here, an improvement in efficiency for file navigation, uh, at the very least, you need to establish that there is this correlation, there's this relationship between the two. Because okay? you cannot have this causal link without at the very least some correlation that may also not be caused. But certainly correlation is a prerequisite for causality. And we're gonna talk more about that too at some point later. Um, or, you know, finally, you can try to get at something that maybe uh, Jane was trying to ask in the first place. Uh, do fisheye views cause programmers to be more efficient at file navigation than conventional views, whatever conventional means here? Um, and still, uh, maybe the most interesting yet, do fisheye views cause programmers to be more efficient at file navigation than conventional views when programmers are distracted, but not otherwise? So not only you know, are you testing some existing causal relationship between these two variables, but you're testing it under some you know, different varying conditions here. You know, it holds sometimes, but not other times, and here's why that is. Okay. What's the difference between causality and causality are comparative questions in, in the example of the two questions? Um, the, the comparative one at the bottom um, includes this um, understanding of the context. The one here says, you know, it's always the case that one causes greater efficiency. 
This one here says. No, uh, that's the interaction one, which I understand. But what about the first and the second one? What's the difference between those two? Oh, um, well, uh, the first one is just the causal relationship period. The second one is. But in here, like you have an improvement, right? Right, exactly. Uh, first, first question already encodes an improvement, so it needs to be like some improvement again. Oh, 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 yes, great, thank you. I, uh, yes, you're right. I, I'm not sure. This, okay. this looks weird. I agree with you. Yes, thank you, thank you. Be because there's an implicit baseline in the first question as well, right? Yes. Uh, correct. You're right. Sorry, I, I don't. Yeah, th these are very similar. You're right. Okay. Um, and maybe the last one, I think, you know, let's say you've established some causal relationship there. Um, maybe now you want to build some tools to support this kind of uh, navigation. So you can ask design style, teams, what is an effective way for teams to represent design knowledge to improve coordination? You've established that this kind of knowledge uh, improves coordination causally, but you're trying to figure out how to best uh, represent that kind of knowledge, design question or tool building question. Um, and could be tools, could be policies, could be practices, could be all kinds of things. But here you're taking this theoretical understanding of the mechanism and you're applying that to some intervention. You're doing something with that knowledge. And you're, you're changing practice, you're building a tool, you're offering a solution, you're changing a policy, you're, you're doing something, you're acting on that knowledge. Because we often see that a good empirical research program, meaning you know, succession of studies and whatnot, uh, starts from this understanding of the problem uh, and ends with some solution, some intervention. Doesn't stop at just understanding the problem, but tries to do something to also help solve the problem. Which is this, you know, kind of moving to this design uh, intervention tooling plan. Okay, yeah, so what, what I just said. Uh, any thoughts on the questions you wrote down? So for both um, Jane and Joe, I Again, are developers more productive using a, a fish eye navigator than a traditional navigator? And particularly, wrote that there's the use of UML client side to get developers more productive. Uh, in both cases, I use the word productive, mm. but then I started thinking, but well, how do you define productive? Which is actually a kind of very easy question. Mm. And so uh, I think that that's the even more definition of productive is, 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 is challenging. Yes, challenge. yeah, like you know, efficiency and so on. Yes. Yeah, yeah thank you. Something else? Reflection. I you know, look, look back. We don't have to do this slide now, but look back at the questions you wrote down at the beginning, and you know, see now uh, how, if at all, you might ask them differently based on what we just talked about. Um, one more thing here. There. Oh, I can move that. Great. Um, we talked in the last lecture about four uh, philosophical worldviews, at least two that are very common, this positivist, post-positivist worldview and the social constructivist worldview. Um, do you remember any of the difference between the two? One is this top-down, uh, whatever, you know, reality is objective, knowledge is objective, top-down thing, that was a positivist, and then the other one, sort of bottom-up reality is a social construct. That was the uh, social constructivist. Okay. Which one, which one was Jane or is Jane? Um, I think that she was about the positivist since she was looking to falsify a hypothesis or not. Yeah. Could could be. I can see that. Any. You might think Jane is a uh, constructivist. Interesting. 
Everybody think Jane is a positivist? Who well, don't have an opinion otherwise? Interesting. Okay, so it, it's very possible that Jane is a positivist, um, in which case she might prioritize uh, designing and running some controlled experiment uh, to causally establish uh, that this fisheye view navigation improves efficiency. Uh, but just as well, she might be a constructivist. Um, and instead of doing a lab study like this, um, you know, she could complain that lab studies are inherently limited. You know, they don't capture any of the real world complexity um, that is found in, in, in the wild. And they're not very useful because of this. You know, whatever they can establish is very artificial, very unlikely that it will ever transfer in, in a realistic real world setting. Um, so, Going and doing field work and you know embedding yourself with these teams and whatnot could be much more useful instead. Um, and it's really in the subtleties and the contextual factors that you figure out exactly how to, uh, you know, what to do about file uh, navigation and efficiency and improvements and whatnot. Not not in a lab study. So she could be either of these things. She could be both of these things. Um, Probably not literally at the same time, but she could be both of these things, you know, throughout the course of her research program, um, as we can all. Um, I guess the point here is that maybe impossible to avoid some commitment to a particular stance because it's just who we are. It's you know, what we what we accept as valid knowledge ultimately, um, and. Um, Probably a lot of what we choose to study and how we choose to answer a particular research question uh, will depend on this stance that we take, you know, explicitly or implicitly. Uh, it was interesting, you know, Kyle went straight for lab uh, experiments. Well, that was her original question. I think she should be a constructivist in this case. Mm. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is, you know, maybe this is more of a reflection of how we view uh, science and what we accept as as valid knowledge with valid answers. It's in the study here. Choose one for me. Uh, can be like complementary. Absolutely. Like we start by doing uh, a controlled experiment and give the results support. The first point, then we move to the real world and testing the real world. So, absolutely, yeah. So, but that's also my point. My point is that um, we we can each um, subscribe to uh, multiple of these worldviews over the course of a research program. Um, sometimes even over the course of a single study, but you know that requires more work, so we rarely get to do that. But certainly over over a longer research program, we get. Uh, we get to do that, we have a chance to do that, and it's usually useful when we do that. It's hopefully what I will uh, teach you by the end of the semester. It just seemed for me a bit silly to be labeling so things that are complementary. Only insofar as it allows us to recognize that they're somewhat different and therefore could be complementary and useful. Labeling, I think, is, is useful and recognizing that they are different. <laughs> So, so that we can, you know, learn to combine them. Maybe. Yeah, that's the purpose of the lab. Okay, so um, could be a good time to stop. Um, there is, you'll find this in the slides, I'll post them right after. Um, I'm giving you a few examples of research questions. Um, I'd like you to think about how you might, what kind of study you might, or methods you might use to answer these questions. We could talk about that at the beginning of class on Tuesday. That's one thing. Um, the other thing, um, there are two papers. They are both in that shared Google Drive folder. Um, I would like you all to skim them very briefly. You don't have to spend a lot of time on this. The technical details are not very important. You know, as usual, I don't care about the, uh, in this case, I guess mostly software engineering technical details. I care about the study designs. Um, so I'd, I'd like you to look at these two papers for Tuesday um, and think 
about answers to these questions. Okay. What kinds of questions, research questions, do the two papers ask? And how does the choice of methods, you know, the authors use, uh, map to or fit the kinds of questions they've asked? as a way to reflect on what we talked about today, you know, different kinds of research questions and the connection from those to different research methods that may or may not be more uh, useful or applicable to different kinds of questions. So we'll, you know, we'll talk about this uh, briefly also on Tuesday a little bit. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts uh, on these. Um, I can send a reminder with these instructions so you don't need to forget, but just FYI, you know, know that this uh, is coming. Uh, so please do these uh, things for Tuesday. Okay? Right. Thank you.